Professor Denning mentioned the allusion to uh, John Keegan. If uh, that's a book you haven't yet read, you certainly uh, want to. I have to say I was torn. I uh, was going to entitle this uh, something that spoke a little more to dangerous uh, robots. So the title of the talk, maybe some of the, uh, I see a, a few uh, silver hairs in the room that might get the reference. Uh, well, you might get it too. So uh, I was going to entitle it, uh, Klatu Barada Nikto. Anyone get that reference? Nelson, do you? Oh, yeah, Shelley. Yeah, what was, that was the instruction to Gort, the robot. Yes, and it's in the original film, which I highly recommend, not the Keanu Reeves uh, remake. Uh, that's a story about an artificial intelligence whose job is to keep everybody else in line, not only on this planet, but on others and of a federation of planets who have given ultimate control to the machines because they could be trusted, whereas biological beings could not. And they allowed themselves to be governed by this. Pretty heady stuff. Pretty heady stuff. Well, how do we think about uh, this issue of, of artificial intelligence? I prefer the term automation uh, simply because, and I think Professor Denning agrees with me, simply because intelligence is a little harder to get, right? It implies something about consciousness. It's something more than brute force calculation of all in alternatives. Uh, and I think we're, uh, like fusion energy, artificial intelligence is always going to be 20 years away. So uh, that's where I'm coming from here. But I think automation is something that will have as profound an influence on military and security affairs in the 21st century as the aircraft did on land and naval warfare in the 20th century. And that's really the challenge we all face is to try to tease this out, to try to figure out uh, what this means for the doctrines by which we fight, the forms by which we organize, the technologies we will emphasize, that we will embed more automation in or not, uh, and ultimately the strategies we'll employ. That's a very attractive looking uh, lunch. I have, uh, no, it, it, in some cultures he'd have to offer that to me now, but it, it looks like, <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. It's, it's okay, you don't, you don't have to. Uh, as, as I see some of my students are in here, I have only uh, two rules and I can't enforce the first one in this uh, room. First one is um, any cell phone noise uh, it costs half a grade per ring. Uh, but uh, the other one is I don't want to hear your food. So be a quiet professional uh, uh, with, with that. So what, what are we uh, doing with automation in these areas? What I'd say is and this is not only in the American case, but most folks are focused on the T, the technology. Uh, note the mnemonic, by the way, so I hope you walk away remembering the idea of DOTS, right? Doctrine, Organization, Technology, Strategy. There's a huge amount of focus on technology. The tools, there's much less on the practices and the structures. That's where organization and doctrine and ultimately strategy come into play. What happens when you have new tools but old practices? You have a century ago the Western Front in World War I where the same tactics of Waterloo were used despite the rise of the machine gun, high explosive artillery uh, and uh, so on. So you have to be very careful to think about new practices that come with the new tools. Now, How do we get our arms around that? How do we get that right? Uh, for naval officers, people in the sea services, uh, this change in, in practice is very, very evident because of the radical technological changes over the last two centuries. Think of Nelson's ship victory at Trafalgar in 1805, right? What was the story there? That was a 40-year-old piece of, of technology. Old technology used some new practices breaking the line, concentrating on part of the enemy force. But if you go forward 50 years to the Crimean War, you find a Russian fleet armed with exploding shells and steamships that blew an entire Turkish fleet out of the water at Sinope. And really one or two of those Russian ships would have destroyed an entire Royal Navy of that 50 year, years earlier. 
go fast forward another 50 years to the rise of the dreadnought all big gun battleship. One of those would have blown the entire Russian fleet from the Crimean War out of the water. Go forward again 50 years and you have the Essex class carriers. You take my point. The face of naval battle changed radically. There had to be new ways of thinking. Engagement ranges vastly increased up to 200 miles. Coral sea battle is fought with the principal ships never coming into sight of each other. Uh, submarines come along. Uh, that's a whole other form of guerrilla warfare at, at sea. Each technology brought with it a demand for a new way of fighting, a new way of organizing, the task force, the fleet trains, etc. And, uh, and so in, in naval affairs has been very, very apparent. Uh, fewer watershed moments in land affairs. Really it comes with improvements uh, a century ago, almost a century ago, in the internal combustion engine which uh, enabled advances with tanks and planes. And of course information systems, the radio, uh, becomes very, very important. And the early high performance computers that broke enemy codes, that hacked the enemy and allowed victories like uh, midway uh, to, uh, to occur and, and uh, many successful operations uh, in, in the West as, as well. So those are watersheds that change the way one uh, fought. Um, how is automation going to do this? I, I think, and uh, we'll go to slide number one here, please. Uh, on, on slide number one, we have one of the enduring themes in uh, military organization which is, should we organize in a few large ways or many small ways? Right? That's a principal question that we want to ask ourselves. And so we have from Alexander to Hannibal, the phalanx, a massed force of uh, spearmen. That's just the heart of uh, the sort of Greek way of, of war for some centuries. And Alexander built a world empire on the basis of this. How is he able to do this against uh, lighter but uh, much more missile-armed forces in, in the east? How fast did this phalanx move on the attack? Somewhere between three and four miles per hour when they were charging. And so they really were only vulnerable to uh, one or two volleys of arrows uh, before they hit the enemy force and just blew it away. Now what happens to old Hannibal at Zama and at the end of the third century before the Common Era in uh, 202? He comes up against this Roman legionary commander, Scipio, uh, who is commanding something of the alternative, a lot of little things, uh, maniples, any survivors of Latin education or Latin Romance language speakers, mano, hand, maniple is a handful. So lots of handfuls and they were able through drill to engage in many different kinds of formations, far more flexible than the phalanx. And Zama was the decisive defeat, as we all know from the Russell Crowe movie, that, that first uh, gladiatorial contest uh, he and his guys had was recreation of the Battle of Zama. Um, and so stay together, stay disciplined, and they had all kinds of drill formations Right, the testudo, the turtle for the guard against missile weapons and uh, loose or tighter formations, maneuvers. Uh, they were able, the phalanx could basically do this at some speed. Uh, the legions could do this and these sorts of things. And uh, Hannibal tried to do a little bit of that kind of maneuver, but his organizational form wasn't as supple. And in the end, he was defeated by the, the legion. So hold on to this idea that many and small and few and large is one of the themes, right? Uh, few large was certainly the theme of militaries for much of World War I that we mentioned a short while ago. But what ended up actually moving the war again at the end of World War I? Something called the storm troops, who were little handfuls of soldiers who engaged in infiltration tactics and uh, came within an ace of winning the war in, in 1918. So that's a kind of replay or yet another iteration of this theme, few large versus many small. Um, many of you here I see in the audience have been engaged in our irregular uh, wars of the last uh, 18 plus uh, years. Uh, we have, well, at one point in Iraq we had 17 brigades, sizable sorts of things. 
and our opponents organized in lots and lots of little things. So this theme is one we want to carry with us and ask ourselves, does automation favor one or the other of these? And I'm going to suggest to you that I think automation favors a lot of this as opposed to some of that. And, you know, two up, one back, sort of a divisional ad, uh, at level advance. Uh, and my concern is that uh, whether in an irregular war or in a, quote, conventional uh, war, whatever that's going to look like, uh, what if these little tots are, some of them are people and some of them are machines, automated machines, some of them are airborne at not very high levels, and suddenly they can do, you know, they can hit, they can move themselves and strike from many, many directions. Suddenly you have something that about 20 years ago I developed a doctrinal concept called swarming, which uh, the Navy now, as you know, is very concerned about uh, as an attack form by the People's Liberation Army Navy. It's a mouthful, isn't it? Can't just say Chinese Navy because their pictographs show that it's PLA Navy. And if you're, in, if you're a naval aviator, what are you in? People's Liberation Army Navy Air Force. So they just keep adding. Uh, anyway, the idea is not a frontal attack or a flanking attack, but a swarming attack. And this is something those of you involved in irregular wars know that a convoy is a prime target for a swarming attack. Um, our U.S. Navy is very concerned about this and we're developing a variety of means, in, including on this campus, efforts to use automated counter swarms of our own. And for a while we held the world's record in the number of automated uh, aerial vehicles that could attack incoming uh, swarms. That's one way to get at it. Another way would be to take an electronic warfare approach, and that's uh, something, too, under, under development. What this means, what does this mean? It's the second sort of point that I want you to hold on to. Uh, let's just, so we don't uh, forget, uh, we have a few large versus, oh, yeah, uh, many small. And the second point uh, that I hope you leave here with is the notion that this state of technological play has vastly empowered the small unit. Now we know this sort of thing in cyber operations already where small groups of hackers or even super empowered individuals can cause huge amounts of, of disruption. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the role of automation in cyber uh, defense and possibly in cyber offense. But especially in defense, I think we have lots of room to do more by way of automation than, than we do uh, today. Uh, so here, the second point is sort of the increased power of the small. Uh, think about the terrorist who stabs a couple people on a bridge in London. Doesn't do a lot of material damage, but he gains the attention of the entire world. Super empowered individual. Right? That's one of the reasons terrorism has moved away. We haven't had another 9-11 spectacular in a very, very long time, and we're probably not going to see that because the terrorists realize that the small events can have just as big uh, an, an impact. So this business of automation, and again, this doesn't have to all be automatons. It can be a mix of people and automaton, automatons, and maybe you don't know which is which, uh, for a while and maybe figuring out which is which is going to be Im important. But the point is they're, they're quite powerful. Uh, they provide uh, the ability to strike, especially in the case of automation, without too much concern about getting it back. Fire and forget, if you, if you will. Terrorists too do fire and forget with suicide bombers. And in fact, the lineal descendant of the automated weapon today is probably the kamikaze of World War II. They didn't have the software to guide those zeros at ships in 1944, 1945, so they used the wetware of dedicated individuals. But that's the basic idea. And, and how effective were the kamikazes? Well, every study done of them suggests that they were highly, highly effective. Uh, at Okinawa, uh, the last major battle of the war, the U.S. Navy was losing two ships 
every three days and uh, let General Buckner know that another week of this and we will have to pull out. Or simply, and, and if there had to be an invasion of Japan, um, there were still over 5,000 kamikazes. And of course, they wouldn't have had to travel that far to get to the battle space. Uh, and they had uh, thousands of, um, what do they call them, right ten um, uh, kamikaze uh, swift boats uh, as, as well. So when people say, well, why did President Truman feel like he had to drop a bomb to stop the war? Well, that invasion was going to be horrific on the Japanese people, but as well as on the invading uh, forces. And um, thankfully, this is not a philosophy or ethics lecture, so I'm not going to uh, go any further uh, into that. Just to say that those kamikazes are kind of model. And what was their doctrine? Their doctrine was the notion of the swarm, overwhelming the defenses of the ships that uh, they, they came at. And uh, they were highly, highly uh, uh, effective. There's a third point, and I know you, you want to get, you're really a very good audience. Many times audiences just say to me, Professor, can we just get straight to the questions? Uh, and so thanks for indulging me. Uh, slide three here speaks to the third point that I, I want to uh, make. And that, does anyone know what these circles are? Any? Any missile person here? How about if I say that, CEP? Circular error probable. Okay, you shoot something. I see you got it, Wayne. Um, okay, so at, at Waterloo, you had artillery could fire a certain range and had a certain amount of accuracy. By the Civil War, 50 years later, a little further range, the mortars, etc., a little less accurate over distance. Uh, by 1915, you had things that could fire. There were some siege mortars that could fire 40, 50 uh, miles, but uh, big circular error probable. Go forward another 50 years by Vietnam, you're starting to see the CEP shrink at uh, a somewhat greater range. And um, that's in part because the information content of weapons is increasing. But what's the situation in recent years? This is quite a range, why is the circular error probable so small? Largely because of automation, automated guidance systems. Is, someone tell me, is the Tomahawk missile a robot? Yeah, yeah, in terms of it's on its own, it's figuring things out. Okay, so this is important, important to the practice of your profession because the long historical tie between range and accuracy has been decoupled. Okay? Now you can shoot things over great, great distances with high, high accuracy. That's one of the reasons these little bubbles here are so powerful, is they can call upon assets that give them tremendous, tremendous disruptive and destructive uh, power. So from the dominant paradigm of emphasis on a few large things, think about it, how many brigades are there in, in the entire US Army? They're you know, somewhere in the 30s. Uh, 10 or 11 strike groups. Although I, I worry about that term, I, maybe they're struck groups. A lot of what you know, goes into one of those groups is about protecting the carrier. Uh, and this notion of great range, high uh, accuracy, empowering the, the small groups. Okay, so let's talk about things. Are there any Air Force officers here? Any who will admit to being in the Air Force? Yeah, yeah, excellent, thank you. So let's talk about what might be an organizational implication. Instead of having just a couple dozen air wings, some dozens of air wings, maybe the unit, the basic unit of action should be something far smaller. Maybe it should just be a squadron. And maybe that squadron should have a couple of planes with pilots in them, a couple of planes that are remotely controlled, and a couple of planes that are fully automated. Wow, that would be very, very interesting. Talk about human systems integration. Now, there may be some places where they just want, oh, let's go with a full automated squadron. And you have that as an option, too. I, I think a gradualist approach to 
toward automating the force is probably the, the way that will be more acceptable institutionally and, and in practical terms, probably a little better. But tell me about the plane that's fully robotized, the uh, drone operated plane as well. Um, to what specifications can they be built? Can you do something better than an F-35? Oh, sorry, that's a, not a trick question. There's all kinds of problems with that one. But the point, what, what, are, what are the limits on what you can do? You can go way beyond the tolerance of a human body if you don't need a human body. So there is a potential for revolutionary change in air warfare based on the incorporation of uh, automation. Uh, so there's an organizational story with doctrinal implications. Technology already exists today. Uh, Britain, I think you have a, a reading that's been uh, uh, posted for you uh, that notes the British have a fully functional robot fighter plane today. This is oh, half a grade. Oh, I can't give half a grade penalty. Sorry. Um, let's figure some other pun. Maybe you have to answer a question. That could be, that's, could be a good one. So uh, the technology is here today to do this. The question is habits of mind, institutional interest, um, basically the path that all militaries, all professional militaries uh, take, which is they prefer uh, gradualism. And, and believe me, that's better than no change at all. Uh, nothing uh, sort of makes my blood run colder than to uh, hear about um, some movements in, in the American military to wash away the lessons of the last 18 years and, quote, re-green uh, the army and uh, get uh, special warfare back to the fleet. It's, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but what comes with that is a mindset of, you know, maybe we're going to see another desert storm. I worked for General Schwarzkopf back then, and I can, I can tell you um, that ain't coming back. I don't think there's anyone going to be foolish enough to uh, set down 60 divisions in open terrain and let us pound them for six weeks and then outflank them com completely. Uh, just, um, I remember in the uh, fall of 1990 having debates about how we're going to go after this force. And at the time, some very decorated senior people were saying, oh, these Iraqis are battle-tested, their artillery outrange, Soviet artillery outranges us, et cetera. And uh, David Hackworth at the time, um, the most decorated soldier in the galaxy, uh, wrote a, a quickie book explaining how we we're going to lose that war. And I remember, you know, we were sitting there debating this, and I remember looking over uh, in one of the briefings at the general and saying, I just see this as a turkey shoot. And we get to see everything all the time. And the Lieutenant Hong's working on ISR. Automation's role in ISR is going to be world changing. What we can do with an orbital automated systems, little things that look like insects to help people in irregular warfare situations, et cetera. The ISR story is as big as the battle story. But uh, in, in any event, so I was asked to expand on this notion that's going to be a turkey shoot. And I said, well, we can see them. They can't see us. Uh, they don't really know, you know, what we're, where we're going to hit them and, and how hard. I mean, their, their disposition suggests that they're trying to do all-around defense and are even, uh, they've even set 12 divisions aside against a marine landing. Um, why don't we just go around the whole thing? And, uh, and um, one of the generals piped up and said, oh, you're trying to out Guderian Guderian, a reference to a very successful panzer general from World War II. And I said, yeah, it's about time. This is 1990, not 1940, right? And uh, so anyway, General Schwarzkopf chose to go all around based on the fact that we had a tremendous information advantage. And a lot of that was through creation of a system, joint surveillance and uh, target acquisition radar system, with a lot of automation in it that gave us a very, an amazing picture. But what was the level of resolution? When General McCaffrey is running the 24th Division on this big left hook, he's getting real-time information about where the artillery coverage of the Hammurabi's ends and the 23rd Division's begins. And he's going to cut in the gap there, and then he's going to blow both of them apart. They, they don't even know he was there. 
and, uh, and again, this highly accurate, longer range uh, weaponry. Dropped a lot of dumb bombs from the air, but we had a lot of smart weapons on the ground, precision guided munitions that uh, made absolute mincemeat. So 148 uh, battle casualties uh, in the war. Uh, nearly 100,000 Iraqi prisoners, and we didn't need to do the highway of death. They, they didn't have to be as many killed as, as were killed. Uh, that's revolutionary change. And I'm here to say that my belief, I've been at this a while and have been calling, calling what's coming uh, with uh, good, good luck so far. And uh, I don't want to leave the mortal coil with a big error, but uh, I'm willing to make a big bet that automation is going to have a similar impact on military affairs. Not by itself, but in conjunction, teaming with humans, improving the way we think. Uh, and when I say that, I'm going to go here to the S on strategy. There's another part of automation that's going to influence battle, and that is in the assessment of strategy, formulation of initial strategies, assessment as they are underway, and after action, evaluation. So I'm uh, involved in something uh, right now called, uh, I call Casey, um, and we're um, uh, setting up teams at DARPA and um, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University and, and Drexel to look into this. Casey with two E's, not a Y on the end. It stands for Comprehensive Automated Strategy Evaluation Engine. And uh, the idea being that, you know, if you can make a computer that can be the world champion of uh, Wei Chi and of chess, maybe we're at a point where an automated system can be some kind of adjunct to human strategizing. Maybe get us to think about things we haven't already thought about, point out a flaw that we hadn't uh, already seen. So I'm suggesting it not yet as a substitute for human judgment, but maybe as a way to augment it. And um, that's something that's, that's underway. So automation, even at this sort of high level, is, uh, I think, capable of making a great contribution. Uh, the biggest challenge, I believe, is going to be organizational in nature. Uh, that is, we have systems. The battalion still exists. Where, how old is the battalion as we know it today? About 500 years old. Right? That's not going away. Uh, although it is interesting to me that the division, certainly in the US Army, the notion of the division is sort of hollow. It's, uh, it looks to me like the brigade is, is the real unit of, of action today. And, um, and that's very interesting that it's, it's moving uh, down. Um, changing from strike groups to little task groups. Oh my, that's going to be very interesting. But we're going to have to think different if we have to engage in a place like the East China Sea or the Taiwan Strait. What happens when your opponent is building sea power without a navy, without a thing that looks like a traditional navy, that relies on hypersonic missiles, supercavitation torpedoes. What's, what's that? That's a torpedo that builds a bubble of air in front of it and can move at 200 knots. Think about that for how, how are you going to defend your ship against that? The only good news is that that bubble of air so far has caused problems with guidance systems. It makes it a little harder for it to be guided well. But if you're firing a hundred of those in the general direction of a strike group, you're going to hit something. You're going to hit something. Brilliant minds, fully automated, intelligent minds that sit on the bottom and they wait and they listen. They can identify what kind of ship is coming over. And when it's a carrier, they'll detach. And they rise up and position themselves right under the keel of a ship so as to explode there and uh, break the back of the, uh, of the carrier. So in naval affairs automation, we may see change some folks' entire vision of what naval battle looks like. It's not going to be Coral Sea or Midway be something very strange, very, very different looking. And that's what we have to prepare for. So uh, maybe there's an organizational form for ourselves that uh, uh, Admiral Roden, 
former commander of Naval Surface Forces, called distributed lethality. Let's have lots and lots of little things. The late Admiral Sobrowski, an, another great champion of thinking like, uh, like Captain Hughes, uh, simply called it, a, you need a street fighter mentality. And uh, we also have to realize that you know, we represent here Americans and allies and friends and we bind ourselves to international law, to the rules and laws of war, our adversaries may not do so. They may be less concerned about collateral damage. What do we care if we hit an oil tanker or not a carrier? We'll get the carrier next time. What do they care about whether an automated system, an automated ground combat system such as the Russians have today, goes into a building and blows itself up and kills a bunch of innocent people? And this ethical matter is something that we have to consider. It is a constraint that we embrace readily and willingly. And we have to move forward with that in mind, that we may have to engage others who don't have similar constraints. Same thing is true in, in cyber war. Right? We have lots and lots of legal and ethical constraints on what we can do. And. Um, since this is an unclassified brief, we won't say a whole lot more about that. But I think there is a natural divide that should allow us to automate our defenses much more. For sure, keep humans absolutely in the loop on offensive action. But frankly, the pace of battle in cyberspace is going to be so fast. It's already so fast that it's beyond human judgment. So we need to rely more and more on automation. We may find that the pace of future battles, swarm battles, is so high that to have a machine capable of strategy evaluation in a, a quick moving battle in the Taiwan Strait may be something that, that we need to, uh, to cultivate. So I think the, it's not just the face of battle that AI changes, it's also the pace of battle. So hold on to that. We're at a point where I should be uh, handing over to questions. Let me make just one last point. If you were in a phalanx, they basically built it around the right-handed model. So you had to hold your spear here, and you had to get this shield, and you had to make sure that you held it in a way that wasn't so much covering yourself, but you also gave some coverage to your buddy here, whose uncovered arm was pushing a spear uh, out. So you, you had really narrow gaps, and you had to be very disciplined. You had to keep moving, even though the arrows were coming down. And if you were in a legion, you had to follow to the T. If the centurion yelled out to Studo, you knew exactly what you had to do. You did it, and they did it in the middle of these battles. Think of the English longbowmen at Agincourt with a French-mounted force, armored men, charging at them, four times their numbers. And they had to maintain their position. They had to fire. The first massed volley fires were really of bowmen even before the musketry of the 16th century, um, massed volleys uh, of, uh, of musketry. And they had maintained, it's, if I may, almost machine-like. And the same is true of the battalions that came in the 16th century, right up to the, the 20th century and, and today. Discipline, following doctrine, meeting the face of battle, and sticking with the plan, sticking with the operation. This demands something of human beings that there's really nothing else that imposes such a demand. And so in a very real sense, the history of military affairs is one of trying to turn human beings into a kind of automaton in battle. Now, what are we trying to do? We are trying to take automatons, technological automatons, and make them more human-like. That's the great challenge. Can they fight with, fight like human beings? Will we get there? That, I think, is the challenge. That is something that here at the Naval Postgraduate School, across our many departments, we explore. And uh, I'm making a big bet that uh, G.I. Joe and A.I. Joe are going to do remarkable things together. Uh, thank you. <laughs>